So I'd like to welcome you. Uh, my name is John Efron. I teach in the history department here uh, at Berkeley. And uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you and to introduce Lisa Leff, who is a professor of history and the associate dean of undergraduate studies at American University. And her specialty is the history of the Jews of France. Uh, she's the author of a book entitled Sacred Bonds of Solidarity, the Rise of uh, Jewish Internationalism in 19th Century France. And she's recently co-edited a, vo uh, a volume uh, with uh, Ethan Katz and uh, Maud Mandel. It's coming out later in the year, entitled Colonialism and the Jews, which is an incredibly important and almost entirely overlooked subject until now. And she's currently working on a book uh, about uh, an anti-Semitic scandal that erupted in 1892 uh, over the bankruptcy of the French uh, Panama Canal Company. Um, but this evening, uh, we're going to hear something else. Uh, Lisa is going to speak about her wonderful book entitled The Archive Thief, The Man Who Salvaged French Jewish History in the Wake of the Holocaust. Uh, the book itself was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award and it was a winner of the Sammy Rule Prize for Jewish Literature. Um, very briefly, and Lisa will, will uh, turn it over to Lisa, but the book is about this uh, man, Zosia Tchaikovsky, who was a Polish-born uh, Jewish historian, um, who took very large numbers, tens of thousands of documents from Europe in the 40s and the 50s, uh, and moved them illicitly to New York, where he eventually sold them to various libraries, Jewish institutions, where they are still to be found to this day, and to collectors and dealers. And you'll hear that this is a story that is by turns <coughs> dramatic and uh, ultimately tragic. Um, and you know, it turns on the interpretation as to whether Tchaikovsky was, in fact, uh, whether he was engaged in a heroic act of salvage or a sort of form of revenge, or was he motivated simply by theft? And uh, to answer that question, um, Lisa examines his motivations, places them within the larger context of the post-war debates about Jewish cultural property and what should be done with the Jewish material remains, or the, the cultural remains uh, of Jewish uh, civilization in Europe in the wake of the Shoah. Uh, one reviewer of the book, one of the most important scholars of French Jewish history, uh, Pierre Bernbaum, said this, in Lisa Leff's superb book, pages fly by as her meticulous and surprising study of the extraordinary life of her hero keeps her reader breathless. And I am sure that she will do the same for us tonight. So take a deep breath. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, John, for that warm introduction. And um, to Etta and everyone for setting this talk up tonight. I'm so, so pleased to be here and talk to you about um, Zoza Tchaikovsky which um, John introduced in such an intriguing way. Now I have to try to live up to that, and keep up with him. Um, so let me start by talking a little bit about where the idea for this book uh, came from in the first place. I first stumbled on the story of Zoza Tchaikovsky um, two decades ago, or more at this point, you know, 25 years ago at this point, when I first uh, went to Paris as a young dissertator completing my dissertation, I had finally you know, gotten the funding to go off and do my research. I was working on a dissertation about the Jews in 19th century France. And once I got into the archives, um, it was impossible to ignore that wherever I went looking for documents about the Jews of modern France, there were simply like inexplicable gaps in the archive. Um, things were simply not where they should have been. And eventually I grew bold and asked first, you know, senior scholars who were also working in the archive and then eventually the archivists themselves. And it's at that point that I heard this incredible story. The reason that so many things were not where they should have been was because they had been stolen by a prominent Jewish historian named Tchaikovsky. 
And this is um, a picture of Tchaikovsky at the height of his career in the mid-50s. Now, Tchaikovsky, I learned at that point, stole widely across the French archives, um, all material related to Jewish history. And after he stole the documents, he brought his stuff to New York, where he used it for his articles, and then sold it piecemeal to Jewish libraries, primarily in the United States, though I would later learn there was also stuff sold to Israel. Eventually, um, he met a tragic end. In 1978, he got caught red-handed stealing at the New York Public Library, not far from his home. Um, and in the aftermath of that, a few days after he was caught, he committed suicide. Now, when I heard the story uh, in the mid-1990s, um, I had actually already heard of Tchaikovsky, and that's because one simply cannot do research in the field of French Jewish history without relying very, you know, in a very foundational way on this man's work. He wrote hundreds of articles. He started publishing scholarly work in French Jewish history at a time when no one else was working as an academic in this field. Um, really in the late 1930s, but primarily, you know, he really takes off in, um, after World War II. He published in five languages. Um, and, you know, when you look at when, when he was doing this, he was working on entirely original documents that no one else had ever cited before, um, working in a total vacuum, right? No one else um, in the conversation, to the point where still today, there's not a topic that a French Jewish historian would work on where you wouldn't go and consult Tchaikovsky first. He wrote on everything. Now, like most Jewish historians of his generation, um, and he was born in 1911, he never held an academic post. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's not considered a scholar. Still today, his studies are foundational for academics and they're in a very scholarly style. He's really considered an academic founding father. And yet, so to get back to like, why did I write this book? And yet what I learned early on as an academic was all of those articles, those hundreds of articles in five languages, they were all based on material that he stole from the archives, right? And then later sold. Um, and I was realizing like all this stuff that I'm working on when I go to the archives, Anytime I work on it in an American institution, I'm working on something that like he stole and later sold. So I was kind of, this was just an amazing thing that as I was doing my dissertation, kept on um, coming up for me. I was just simply intrigued. And so at the start, my book was simply just a hobby, a quest to get to the bottom of the question, why would he do it, right? Why would a Jewish historian just like me, someone so serious about his work, a scholar, why would he do this? And then kind of in the fullness of time, not right away, it took some, uh, some time for it to occur to me that there's a second question bound up in the first that's just as important. And it's the getting to this question that made me realize there's a book here. And that's this. Why would the libraries have bought from him? Because if you think about it, this question is really at least as critical as the first, because however criminal, however pathological Tchaikovsky's motives may have been that led him to steal, he would never have done such risky, um, something so risky over so long a period of time. Um, if there hadn't been willing buyers, right? So a question about him, why would he do it? And then a question about the libraries, about Jewish research libraries in America, who were the market um, that he was stealing and selling to. Um, so tonight what I wanna do um, is take some of your time to sketch out the answers to these questions, the story that I discovered, and then we'll leave some time um, for your questions. Tchaikovsky's story begins in Paris in the 1930s. Um, 
Tchaikovsky was born in 1911 in Poland, but when he was 16 years old, he moved to Paris to follow his older brothers who had come to the city before him. Um, and like his older brothers, he had come just seeking a better life, a better economic conditions. And at first, he, like his brothers, just worked in the garment trades like many, many other Polish Jewish immigrants in Paris in the 1920s and 30s. But he wound up being a kind of unusual guy because even though he had abandoned his formal education when he left Poland in um, 1927, when he was still quite young, right before he finished high school, um, by 1934, so by the time he was in his early 30s, he actually stopped working in the garment trades and instead found work as a journalist, as a writer. So this is a man who, even as a young man, had some ambition. He was a self-taught intellectual. Um, the first newspaper, the, the newspaper where he got his start was actually the communist Yiddish daily in Paris, the Naya Pressa, that speaks to his origins, right? He was a worker, he was a communist. Um, but while he was there, what he found was he just liked writing. He just liked writing and he liked research. Um, and in his research, you know, journalistic research, um, reporting about Jewish life in Paris at the time, he made, um, he made all sorts of connections, right, in the Yiddish-speaking world in Paris. And by the late 30s, um, a group of people that he had connected with had brought him into a totally different way of life. Um, by the late 1930s, he quit writing for the Naya Pressa, and he underwent this second change when he became a historian. And that was all because of these connections that he made. Um, probably sometime around 1935 or 36, he met this couple, Elias and Riva Cherikover, um, who were historians, also from Eastern Europe, also Yiddish speaking, but um, a generation older. They're born in the early 1880s, whereas he's born in 1911. Um, what they did, and these two really became kind of surrogate parents to Tchaikovsky, and they, the more he got to know them, the more he got imbued with the passion they brought to um, Jewish history, to doing a specific kind of Jewish history, a Jewish history based on documents, a scholarly style Jewish history where you're going and finding, right, you're not just telling a story about a community, you're analyzing documents in a very scientific way and then you're um, citing them. Now, um, Cherikover, I said, was also from Eastern Europe, and he, always assisted by his wife, you know, they're part of this generation where often a scholar is actually a husband and wife team, but we never mention the wife. So I'm just going to mention the wife for once. They worked, <laughs> they worked together, um, Elias and Riva Cherikover, and um, they together ran um, the historical section of the Yiddish Scientific Institute better known by its acronym YIVO, um, and YIVO's main office was in Vilna. It had been founded in 1925 in Vilna. But what many people, many people have heard of YIVO, perhaps some of you have because it still exists today, and we'll talk about YIVO a lot tonight because it really became the center of Tchaikovsky's world. But what many people don't know is from the time it was founded in 1925, YIVO was actually always a kind of decentralized place. It had this central office in Vilna, which was like the flagship, but then it always had offices in other places, including New York, briefly Berlin, and this office that practically no one knows about, because it was there so briefly, the Paris office. And it was at this Paris office that Tchaikovsky met the Cherikovers and became just totally, it was like, he had found his calling in life to do what the Cherikovers and a whole bunch of other Yiddish-speaking historians um, were doing, which was to write Jewish history on the basis of documents. So to understand why Tchaikovsky fell in love with Jewish history, you have to understand what the Cherikovers saw the mission of the Jewish historians. So that's, I'm going to take a little moment and talk about them. <clears throat> 
For the Cherikovers, they had come to Paris in 1933. And what they were doing there was they had gotten this one bedroom apartment in the 15th arrondissement that was just filled from floor to ceiling with books and documents. Their apartment was a one bedroom archive. Um, and they had kind of gathered around them other scholars who came in and they would have these kind of salons talking about Jewish history and sharing their work. And this, you know, these discussions that were so electrifying to Tchaikovsky. For them, the project of building archives, even if it's just an archive in your apartment, right, even if it's not in an institution, this was central to Jewish survival in the 20th century. So even though they're doing it in a scholarly way, the ambition goes far beyond the, what we now would say merely academic. It's not just for fun for them. For them, this is the very heart of Jewish survival. Um, on the one hand, and maybe you know, we kind of trace this um, in the Cherikovers' lifetime, this was the first, you know, early on by say, 1905, they had already um, come to embrace Jewish history, but early on they saw it as a response, a kind of existential response to the challenges of modernization that they had seen around them um, in Eastern Europe, right? And what I mean by that is this, when I say modern, you know, modernization is such a big broad word, what I really mean is the Jews of Eastern Europe, they were based in Ukraine, but really you could say this for all of you know, the former Russian Empire. Jews had begun to move to cities, leaving behind the traditional towns. They had changed their traditional occupations. Um, and most importantly, as they moved to the cities, many abandoned traditional ways of life, right? This is something the Cherikovers embraced. You can see that They're, they were originally Russian speakers and look at what they're wearing. They're very modern people. But at the same time, they strongly believed that if Jews were going to be Jews in the modern world, then the fact that all these like, long traditions of the Jewish people were disappearing, this was a terrible problem, right? So if Jews are gonna have the strength to go forward, they have to be like any other people and have like a repository of their traditions that they can look at. Now they would of course look at their traditions and take strength from them in a very modern way through academic study, but the purpose was to give strength so that the Jewish people could face the future, okay? We might call this a kind of scholarly Jewish nationalism. Right? It's not Zionism, but it's definitely nationalism. It's about giving um, knowledge, a knowledge base of the Jewish past to the Jewish people so that they can know who they are and from where they came. And so it's for that reason that they were so passionate about the early historical and archive creating projects that preceded the creation of YIVO. Stuff like going around and writing down old folk tales and kind of collecting them in that way, or collecting songs, or collecting documents, old um, moil books, circumcision records, or other kinds of records that came out of the old Jewish communities. And when YIVO was founded, a lot of these documents got put in that Vilna archive. So that's one element. It's a kind of Jewish nationalism. And this, when Tchaikovsky heard it, he's like, yes, I want to be part of that. That's such an exciting project. But there's a second part, too. Um, for the Cherikovers, becoming collectors, becoming archivists, and also becoming historians was also a way, and increasingly so, for Jewish people to respond to anti-Semitism. For them, for the Cherikovers, this actually started in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. They had actually been ardent proponents of the Russian Revolution. They believed deeply in the changes that it was gonna mean, especially for Jews, right? Because they were gonna outlaw anti-Semitism. It was gonna be great for the Jews. But then, as you may know, where they were based, Ukraine, after the revolution, um, and in the context of the Civil War, there were terrible massacres of Jews that are now remembered to history as the Ukrainian pogroms. Um, these atrocities were on a level that people who saw them, like the Cherikovers, said was completely unprecedented. 
And when you actually read their accounts and other firsthand accounts of the time, the language that was used to describe the Ukrainian pogroms is actually very similar to what Jews would later use to talk about the Holocaust. And it's very, um, you know, and the numbers of people killed is, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. Though the estimates weigh, you know, this is um, an area where there's a lot of scholarly debate and it's hard to get good numbers. But they responded, um, as you might expect, they formed a team with other, um, with other intellectuals in their region, and they went out all around the region collecting firsthand testimonies, right? They responded by archiving. What they believed is if you could get the evidence of what had been done to the Jews, then someone somewhere, somewhere would look at it and there would be justice. And they actually had lots of reason to believe this um, in the you know, 1918, 1919 when they were on these collecting projects because it really did, they really did believe that it was possible that the new Soviet government, which had outlawed anti-Semitism, would, if they just saw the evidence, right, then they would prosecute. So they actually created this giant archive about the Ukrainian pogrom, um, pogroms and took it first to Moscow where they, as you might imagine, were wound up horribly disappointed. Um, the Soviets didn't want to do anything about this. So instead of going back, they took their archive and had fled to Berlin, where they stayed and began a lifelong project that they would keep doing for the rest of their lives to try to publish all of this evidence in the hope that someone somewhere, sometime, would bring um, the perpetrators to justice. Doesn't this sound like so much of what happened in the aftermath of the Holocaust as well? It's very interesting. So all this, you know, back to Tchaikovsky. When Tchaikovsky met the Cherikovers in the late 1930s, what they were doing was so exciting, I can imagine that to anyone who encountered it, it would be hard to resist, and especially to someone who had, as a young man, man been passionate about politics. He had been a communist. Now, Meeting these people, he said, you know, what did the communists ever do for the Jewish people, really? What we need is a new politics that's not a politics, that's scholarship. If we really want to help Jews, we've got to abandon our dreams of socialism and embrace knowing our history, right? That's how we can face the future as Jews and defend ourselves when we need to. So that's what he's doing. He quits the Naya Pressa and he starts writing these works of history, right? He's gonna write, he in 1939 got a grant from YIVO to spend a year researching um, the history of Polish Jewish immigrants in 19th century France. And he started writing it um, in the summer of 1939. Of course, war breaks out in September and this whole circle of YIVO historians in, Par in, in Paris scatters to the four winds. And the Cherikovers go very quickly to New York in 1940 because they have the support of YIVO New York, who are able, you know, whose leaders are able to get them visas so that they could go. Tchaikovsky, it takes a little bit longer. Um, he had to go through serving in the French Foreign Legion, being gravely injured, surviving a Moroccan concentration camp, um, a terrible refugee boat, but he too finally arrives in New York in September 1941. But after arriving in New York, September 1941, he barely has time to reconnect with the YIVO Paris people who have also made their way there when in December 1941, the United States enters World War II. And he, like so many other young refugees, uh, Jewish refugees from Europe, wastes no time in signing up for the US Army. He served as an interpreter um, and a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division. This was a unit you know, best known as the All-American. They, they were elite paratroopers who landed at D-Day. Um, actually, before D-Day, D-Day was in the morning. They landed at night. He landed at 3 a.m. on the, you know, behind the enemy lines. And then he winds up staying in Europe, um, accompanying the 82nd Airborne as they fought their way across France, 
and, um, and eventually into Germany. And he stays in Europe through the end of 1945. While he was a soldier, Tchaikovsky's commitment to collecting documents was, if anything, stronger than ever. When he was fighting in France, he spent a lot of his time gathering documents about what had happened to Jews during the war. He was very interested in this. From a personal perspective, his brothers and their wives and children had spent the war in France, so he was just like, what happened to them? All of his old friends, this was a guy who was incredibly well connected um, across all the political parties, so he spent a lot of time just trying to find out what happened to his friends. But then in a much larger way, and you can, you know, this is why I wanted to tell you about the Cherikovers, he just wants to document what happened, right? So he gets underground periodicals that the resistance published, and he gets um, documents of Jewish organizations and their response. Probably the most important set of documents that he found in France were the papers of the UGIF, which is the French Jewish organization that was created to serve as an intermediary between the Jews and the occupiers, right? So it's like in this kind of morally ambiguous place, they answer to the occupiers, but they are all Jewish leaders that grow out of Jewish tradition and they, you know, they're leaders of the Jewish community. Those papers, in the immediate aftermath of the war, you might imagine nobody wanted to claim them, right? Can you imagine why? Claiming them would say, like, I own this organization. I am the representative. No one wanted to take responsibility for that organization. So it was relatively easy for Tchaikovsky to take the, big, you know, the first sets of Ujif papers, um, and he sent them to New York, to the YIVO where he thought these will be important to preserve for future generations to look at this question. Um, and that's why, actually, incidentally, if you ever want to study, I feel like there always need to be helpful hints in a lecture like this. If you ever want to study the Jews in France during the Holocaust, you might think everything would be in France. But actually, one of the most important collections of material on the Jewish experience in France during the war is in New York at the Evo. Right, and this is why he brought it. Then, in the summer of 1945, so after the war is over, at the beginning of the Allied occupation of Berlin, Tchaikovsky got a new job. Because of his command of languages, um, and I don't think I mentioned this, but he, you know, he was hired as an interpreter by the US Army because they, they expected that as a native Yiddish speaker, who had spent a bunch of time in France, he spoke English, sort of, French, and German. Now, he always, like in his papers, he always says, like, I don't know why they think I know German. Um, but if you've ever heard Yiddish, or if you've ever studied it, or if you speak it yourself, you know that if you speak German, I mean, if you speak Yiddish, you can understand German, right? So, but the, the thing that he didn't know and, um, until he was, um, confronted with it in France was that the fact that his early childhood education was all in Polish meant that he could converse with Poles. Um, bet you didn't know that there were Polish soldiers fighting for the Germans in France. I didn't know that until I researched this and I realized that he was um, talking to them. There were also Russian POWs in the German army at that point, and he was able to converse with them because sort of miraculously he discovered he had such a facility with languages that he also could speak Russian. Okay, so here's a guy who basically speaks all the languages that are necessary for the war, and that made him invaluable to the Allies. And that's why in July of 1945, he's reassigned to Allied command in Berlin. Right, and Berlin was divided into zones, and so there were um, English speakers, French speakers, Russian speakers, and of course the Germans. Someone like him who spoke all of these languages had a job, right? So he's still at the lowest rank, he's not an officer, but he's a very important interpreter in Berlin there. He is so filled with rage against the Germans, um, and yet, you know, he has to be there. So what does he do? Um, Whenever he can get away from work, uh, he says, well, all of his friends are going to, um, 
try to pick up German girls. What he did was go into the ruins of the bombed out Nazi, former Nazi ministries, right? This was a city that was in um, total ruins, right? Because there had been nightly bombings through the spring in Berlin by the Allies, by the um, British and Americans. And then in May, there had been this, you know, the very end of the war in Berlin, there had been street fighting with the, um, with the Soviets. So this city was just totally um, destroyed. And, um, and yet, these former Nazi buildings were full of papers, right? So what Tchaikovsky did was go in. Now, there were guards all around them because already the Allies were like, we're going to make war crimes trials, so we need to make sure that we keep these documents safe. Somehow, Tchaikovsky gets by them, and um, he just starts carting stuff out. He was in Berlin for six months. In that time, he sent an average of two to three packages per day back to the YIVO. Um, in one letter home to, the Cher you know, to New York, to the Cherokovers, he said, the only limit on my sending packages is the amount of string that I need to tie them together, right? He's like, I'll just send everything. Um, and one of the things I thought was fascinating is that you know, if you know anything about American um, army policy, you know that this kind of thing, taking papers out, is totally against the regulations, right? This is called looting. Um, but one of the things that was fascinating to me was how openly he did this, right? One proof of how open it is is the existence of this picture that I found, right? He somehow, in the middle of doing this, like this is definitely him going through and you know, sorting through documents to take them, right? That's the implication here. And yet he had somebody come down and take a snap a photo of himself doing it. And then he proudly sends it to the Cherokovers. I found this in the Cherokover collection, this photograph. Um, so that means that even though what he was doing was illegal, it was tolerated, right? The other thing I saw was that you know, he's hauling out a lot, like, heavy documents um, to send to, to YIVO, and he, like, it's really hard work, you know, this is, like, physical labor. So he gets the Jeep, the army Jeep driver and all of his, like, army buddies to come in and help him. And then when they want to send it off to New York, how do they do it? The army post office. Right? So there's so many levels at which there's, like, uh, even though this is illegal, it's not just that nobody's stopping him. There's a lot of people helping him. Now, it was easy for me when I read Tchaikovsky's letters to the Cherokovers in this period, it was easy for me to understand why he was doing this. He wanted the papers of the perpetrators. This is exactly what the Cherokovers had done in Ukraine during the Ukrainian pogroms. This is the evidence of what happened. And Tchaikovsky was so upset at this point, um, believing that the Americans and the other allies, he knew that there were war crimes trials coming. They were already preparing for it. But he was certain, um, maybe, and maybe he, maybe he was right and maybe he was wrong. We can discuss that later. But he was certain that they didn't care at all about the crimes that the Nazis had committed against the Jews. So he's like, fine, they're going to prosecute the Nazis for all sorts of stuff. Aggressive war, right? Those were the charges that were um, eventually became the basis of the trials. Aggressive war, but they're never going to say, you murdered the Jewish people. That's not going to be a, um, a charge. And for that reason, he said, we need to build our own case. And that's what he's doing here. It's not papers of Jews he's interested in Berlin. It's the proof of what the Nazis had done. And again, tip, tip for historians. If you want to research the Nazis, um, there are a lot of places to look. But one that's really underused is the so-called Berlin collection at YIVO, which is what Tchaikovsky had taken, mostly from the propaganda ministry. So again, easy for us to understand why Tchaikovsky did what he did in Berlin. But as I pointed out, he had all sorts of um, other people helping him, people who should have stopped him if they were following the regulations. Why did they let him do it? Why did they collude? 
To answer that, you need to understand something about the context of 1945 uh, in Berlin. Because Tchaikovsky was not the only person in 1945 in Germany who was carrying out a Judaica salvage operation. There were many other such operations going on all over Germany, and these operations would only grow in number in the next few years, in 46, 47. Um, so let's take a look sideways at who else was in Germany at this time looking for Judaica and spiriting it out, even though they probably, it was probably against the law. Um, as many of you probably know, you know, the context for this is that as the Allied armies made their way across Germany in 1945, um, what they found um, surprised them, and that was that you know, they, had, they had known that the Nazis had been looting Jewish cultural property during the war, but they hadn't, and they'd even actually signed a declaration in 1943 that they would give everything back Right, they would, they would return everything to its original owners. That's how kind of confident and moral they had been as they came into Germany. But what surprised them was the scope, right? They never would have said, we'll return everything if they had understood the scope of Nazi looting. What they found was Jewish cultural property stashed everywhere, caves, salt mines, castles, warehouses. Now this loot included Probably you know about the art, right? Because you've seen some movies about it maybe or read about it. Um, there was also lots of furniture. Um, there were also pianos, violins. Um, but what concerns us here is the books. Um, what the Allies found was about three million books that the Nazis had looted from Jewish libraries as well as individuals across Europe first in Germany, but then in all the places they conquered. And um, they had stashed them in a few different places, the largest place being Frankfurt, where they had actually created a library of Jewish studies. You probably didn't know that the Nazis had created this Jewish studies research center in Frankfurt, which had the largest Judaica library in history. Um, so they found that, and then they found other smaller collections and moved everything um, up to Offenbach Archival Depot, which was a former um, warehouse, you know, um, IG Farben actually factory outside of Frankfurt. And they just centralized all this Jewish cultural property there. So here you see some books, and here there's also Torah scrolls, and there was other cultural property like that. Um, and what the Allies did in Offenbach, and I have a Here's a picture of the depot as a whole. Uh, at the, in, this is probably in 1946 or maybe even 45 before they started really um, figuring out what to do with it. So what they were doing in 1945 at the same time that Tchaikovsky is in Berlin, you know, doing his one-man salvage operation, is that they're sorting and trying to identify these books, which at first was quite difficult because at the very beginning, they didn't even have anyone who could read Jewish languages. And most of these books were in Hebrew or other Jewish languages. Um, many of the books didn't have identifying information, right? And remember, the Allies had promised, we're going to give everything back to its pre-war owners. They don't even necessarily know who those are. And then, of course, if you did, many of these pre-war owners were now dead. Um, so they, um, in 1945, they're kind of in a holding pattern. And all they have is a principle, um, which is um, that, and this is coming out of the Americans, where they said, OK, if we can't figure out who the individual is to give it back to, or if the um, institution, like the library that stuff comes from, is now defunct, then what we're going to do is give it back to the country that it came from and let them decide what to do. So this actually caused a huge uproar in New York among Jew Jewish cultural leaders, right? Among um, primarily refugees were totally upset about this. And that's because if you think about it, what this means is, for example, Yivo's library. Yivo and Vilna had this huge archive and library. It was found in Frankfurt. 
Um, and you know, it was in this Offenbach archival depot. According to this policy, what would happen to YIVO's library would be it would be repatriated to Lithuania. It would be the property, right? YIVO's defunct. The Jewish people of Vilna are mostly, you know, had mostly died. Um, but the property would go to the Lithuanian state. And like people in New York, like people running YIVO in New York, were extremely upset about this, saw it as completely, completely outrageous. They were even more upset when they heard any, the plan was that anything that they couldn't figure out where it should go would just stay in Germany, right? To them, this was an outrage um, because they believed strongly that Jewish books and Jewish things needed to go where Jewish populations were so they could be, again, like back to like what do libraries and books and all this mean to these people? These are things from which the Jewish people can take strength, right? Study is about building up the Jewish people. It doesn't make any sense to have Jewish things in a place where there are no Jews. So that's why uh, Jews based in New York founded a nonprofit organization called Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. Its, um, its head was the Jewish historian Salo Barone, who taught at um, Columbia University. And its executive director, the person who ran daily operations, was the philosopher Hannah Arendt. And they basically negotiated with the State Department for the right to decide what would be done with any materials that you know, weren't easily um, returned to their original owners, which turned out to be you know, something like 500,000 books. It was an amazing decision in 1947 when the US government gave them the right to do that. Right? It's amazing and unprecedented in a legal sense, if you think about it, because basically they had recognized Jewish cultural reconstruction in 1947 as the legal representative of the Jewish people, right? A people without a state, a people who've never been recognized as having the legal standing of you know, Lithuania or France, right? Now is being treated like a state even before there is a state. And it's not Israel that they're recognizing. They're rec recognizing this Jewish culture, this nonprofit organization incorporated in New York. And they allowed them to decide where the books should go. And here's how this relates to the story of Tchaikovsky. Just like Tchaikovsky, these two scholars who ran Jewish cultural reconstruction and the many other Jews around them believed that Europe was a vast graveyard, that the Jews of Europe, there was no future for the Jews in Europe, and Jewish cultural property just simply did not belong there. This kind of shows you that around Tchaikovsky, even in 1945, all of the people he most respected, these are great scholars, right? These are people he really looked up to. All of these people in New York, even if something was against the law that he was doing, they supported him, they applauded him, they treated him like a hero. And in fact, even in 1945, they wrote about him in the Yiddish press in New York as you know, our intrepid man on the front, you know, doing these heroic feats of Judaica salvage. Even though it wasn't legal, in those kind of exceptional times, everybody felt like the common sense was, you've got to do what's right. In this, in a way, it's no different than those many Jewish army chaplains who went AWOL when they were in Europe to go and try to help displaced persons when they met them, right? They broke army regulations in order to do what they felt would help the Jewish people. And Tchaikovsky was no different. Right? So this is why he's doing this. He may be more passionate about it than most, but he is clearly operating in a context where everyone understands that um, if you're going to reconstruct Jewish life after this genocide, you have to take the stuff out of Europe. And if the Americans are going to dilly-dally about it, well, then just do it. You know, In a way, in the book, I argue, this is actually when he becomes American because he's acting like an American. Right? He's just like, oh, I don't need to follow the law, I'll just do what's right, you know? Which is so much of our, um, what we say about GIs in World War II. So often, they do what they believe is right, even if it's not exactly um, following the regulations. That's Tchaikovsky during the war. That's the kind of 
you know, when I, under, when I try to understand why was Tchaikovsky an archive thief, I think about this whole period where he was just so impassioned about his mission to do Jewish history and make Jewish archives and to take them where this stuff belonged. And at that moment, he was a hero and recognized as such by the Jewish community of New York. And even the Americans eventually say, yeah, actually, that's right. What's funny about Tchaikovsky and makes him different than these two um, and the many other um, Jewish scholars who wound up in Europe in 45 and 46 um, is that in the 1950s and 1960s, he kept doing it, right? They stopped going to Europe, and they certainly didn't go into any archives and just take stuff, right? But Tchaikovsky did. So this is where my story kind of turns. Um, and let me tell you about what he did. Um, Tchaikovsky returned, starting in 47, he returned frequently to Europe as a historian simply looking for material for his articles. He was based at YIVO in New York, <clears throat> where he worked as a researcher and sometimes as an archivist. And when he had the opportunity to go to France, he went everywhere. He went to public archives, like the National Archives or Regional Archives. Um, but he also went places that weren't archives at all, that he thought might have documents about Jews, like the back of synagogues, right? Just looking in there, the desks in the back. Or um, in, he went into like mortgage registries, like anywhere that he could think of might have documents about, um, about Jews. And in many of these institutions, he stole material. It's very hard to know exactly what he stole, and I spent 10 years trying to figure that out. Um, this is probably an impossible project because if you're a very good thief, you don't like leave behind in the archive a record of what you stole, right? It's just gone. So it's very hard to reconstruct what's missing, um, but we know that it's a lot, and we know that it started soon after the war. And here, and this is an important point, that old reasoning that might have worked in the war, that European Jewish life was over and Jews needed to reconstruct in New York, that couldn't have been motivating him now. Because in France, in even the late 40s, but certainly by the 50s, and definitely by 1961, right, he could see that French Jews had not only survived the war in large numbers, 75% um, of French Jews survived the war, but their numbers were actually growing with a large immigration from Eastern Europe and then eventually from North Africa. Their institutions were rebuilding as well, including these synagogues, right, which were operating. These weren't like old remnants, old synagogues. These are like, actually he's talking to rabbis who have congregations, convincing them that he should be allowed into the back to write their histories, and then slipping the stuff in his briefcase, right? These are the very institutions that he was stealing from. So he knew that they were there. He knew France was not a vast graveyard for Jewish life. Um, one question I had about it, though, was, you know, it seems like given the scope of what he was doing, it should have been fairly obvious that he was stealing to the librarians. Why did they let him do this for so long? How was he able to do this undetected? Um, the answer here is depressing, so I'll share it with you. Um, I'll take one example, and that's the example of what happened at the largest Judaica library in France then and, and now as well, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, um, which was a very large library even before the war. Um, in 1947, librarians at the Alliance um, suspected that Tchaikovsky had stolen some stuff from them. And I was so happy to find this picture of the librarians from the 50s. Here they are, my heroes. Um, they, they suspected, I found correspondence in the back that they suspected that he had stolen some stuff from them. But at that point, very interestingly, they chose not to go to the police with their suspicion and instead embarked on this whole complicated process of figuring out where the stuff had gone. And they sent a friend who was based in New York over to that 
Library, the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the conservative seminary in New York. They sent a friend over there to check out what they had recently acquired. That friend saw what it was, right? Saw, oh yeah, here's all the stuff from the Alliance, and convinced the librarian at the JTS in New York to sell it back to the Alliance. And the Alliance was like, paid them to get their stuff back. Doesn't this seem weird to you? Um, but here's why they did that. Two reasons. One, if they went to the police, they would need to provide proof that this stuff was stolen. The Alliance was in a weird position in 1947 and a tragic one. Their entire library of 500,000 volumes had been looted by the Nazis in 1940, in July of 1940, and had formed part of that Frankfurt library. The Americans found it. And in 1947, they got back all, they believe, all of the collection, everything. So they were among the lucky ones. The problem, they never got the card catalog back. So they had the books, but they had no proof of what was in the collection. To say something's missing when you don't have the card catalog, right? It took the librarians at the Alliance until 1961 uh, to reconstruct that card catalog. They had no paperwork. And it was like in that shambles that Tchaikovsky had wandered into the back where they had all this stuff that had just come back. It was the very year the stuff came back and just picked up some volumes that he wanted, took them to New York and sold them to JTS. So in that chaos, there was no way they could make a case. And of course, it would have been very difficult to do so politically at that moment. If you think about what it might have been like in 1947 in France, yes, the war was over, but anti-Semitism wasn't gone. What would it look like a Jewish criminal stealing from a Jewish institution? So instead, they relied on the trust uh, between Jewish librarians, expecting that you know, between professionals and we're all Jews, we'll do the right thing. And in a way, they were right. They got back that stuff that Tchaikovsky had stolen in 1947. But what they hadn't counted on was that Tchaikovsky would continue to steal and would continue to sell to JTS, but also to pretty much every Jewish library in America. So Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, Yeshiva, <clears throat> Yeshiva University Library, so the Orthodox, Brandeis after it was founded, even um, large Judaica collections in universities like Columbia, Harvard, um, and eventually to Israel, uh, the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People bought a lot of stuff. When I looked at the evidence of the crimes and the sales, it's clear that the motives evolved by the 50s. Earlier during the war, Tchaikovsky took Jewish papers for ideological reasons, as part of his desire to rescue or save the Jewish people. But now, by the 50s, he was doing it for a whole set of other reasons. Primarily, it appears, for money. He needed money to support himself as a scholar working outside of academia. And that money was only available where, where there were willing buyers. Now I turn to that other question, right? This final part of my talk is about the libraries, because it has to end with them. Why would they have bought from him? I said, this is my second question, and so perplexing. Well, let's look at what they bought and who bought. So it's interesting just to look at the documents, and I hope there's some librarians with us tonight. This is a document that I found at the Jewish Theological Seminary. It's a bilingual French-German document from the era of the French Revolution from Strasbourg. Um, and if you look at it, you can see that it's kind of unusual in its appearance in that um, it has a square cut right in the top corner. If you were a librarian, maybe some of you are, um, what would this suggest to you? It's an old document and like the time has worn away the edges. Some things, that's a cut with the scissors, right? And you don't get a square cut just because. And it's precisely where there might be an archival ownership stamp. On the first page of a document, often there's a stamp there. So if someone has cut that, imagine you're a librarian and a guy shows up with his trench coat. It's like, I've got something to sell you. And it has this square cut. 
Wouldn't you suspect something? That's why I wanted to show you what the documents look like. And then there's these weird ones. This one has all sorts of writing on it. This is an 18th century document that I found in Cincinnati um, at the Hebrew Union College Library. And on the top, do you see that name stamp? Do you see that stamp? Yes. That, you probably can't see it from where you are, but it's a Yiddish um, name stamp. It says Zion Tchaikovsky. He, on many of these documents, he put his name on them. You know, um, sometimes people ask me, like, how did you know these documents were from Tchaikovsky? Here's how I know. On many of them, he has his name stamp. Um, here's another one that he wrote on. He had a unique numbering system. Here's another one that he wrote on. These are 19th century. And here's one from Brandeis where he wrote his name again in Yiddish, on one of the pages. So this is the kind of thing they bought, things that were clearly marked as in Tchaikovsky's possession, and many things that have been mutilated in many ways. Um, all things that were purchased very out of context, right? Single, uh, he sold them one by one. The, why would they buy them? Why would they buy things like this? I found my answer to this when I just simply read the annual reports of these institutions. What were these libraries all about in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when they were acquiring? Their mission was clear. This was an era in which libraries were trying to build institutions that were unparalleled. They were trying to make the best Judaica library in the world. And you might say, OK, that's totally banal. And that's what I thought when I read it, until I read it enough times that I realized, what was the tone? What was the reason they needed to have this, that they were bringing to this? And it was a whole discourse of rescue. Throughout these reports, they say over and over again that with the demise of the great Jewish institutions of learning, primarily in Germany, but throughout you know, Central Europe, Really, all the Jewish people had was America. Um, it's the disdain for Israel in this is really striking, right? All they have is the great libraries that they were going to build that were going to bring together all this stuff that was being salvaged out of Europe. Their belief was American Jews had always been kind of in second place to Europe, right? They were, we were kind of like, a, like country cousins not very intellectual. The rabbinate here was always considered you know, nowhere near as good as in Europe. Um, not even focused that much on learning, right? More pastoral, in some ways disdainful of learning for a long time. And in this era, they totally turn around. In these seminaries, they say, what is the rabbinate going to be in the future? It needs to be based on learning. We need to take the place of what those great German and Central European seminaries once were. So for that reason, they became, all of these seminaries became the largest repositories of materials distributed by Jewish cultural reconstruction, right? All that stuff that Hannah Arendt and Salo Barone brought out of Germany went to places, Brandeis wasn't around yet, so not Brandeis, but Hebrew Union College, Jewish, Theological Seminary. They are the great beneficiaries. And it was also from this sense of mission that the librarians in these institutions bought what was offered to them by Tchaikovsky and by many other individual GIs who said, hey, I was in Europe and I found this. Will you buy it for $5? They bought so many things. It was part for them of a larger orphaned Jewish heritage for which they understood themselves to bear special responsibility. So I, ironically, it's the framework of rescue that made them collude in a theft. What impact has all of this had on French Jewish history, right? These sales, are they significant? Um, remember how Tchaikovsky sold his booty, right? He, bought, he found the stuff in Europe, he brought it back, he obviously used it in his scholarship. And then he sold the stuff piecemeal. So let's say he wrote an article about uh, the history of a synagogue in Bordeaux. 
write an actual topic of a fascinating article that I recommend to you all. When he was done with the article, he sold off the stuff he had used to write it, right? So he had gotten the stuff from Bordeaux, he brought it to New York, now he's done. It's like, I would say, this is like my students at the end of the semester, you know, they buy the books, but then they sell them back, right? They need the money. Um, but rather than sell it all in one place, he sold it piecemeal. So one document to New York, one document to Cincinnati, one document to Harvard, right? Things that had once been grouped together are now separated and dispersed. I gave a lot of thought to why he did that. Inevitably, when I've talked to people about it, they say, was he trying to make it impossible to get caught? I think the answer is much more banal. Probably not, because if you think about the logic of the market, you get more money when you break up a collection. You'll probably get $5 per document, which is what I know he got at um, Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. But if you sold all the documents together, they'd probably want a discount. Right? If you want to be a good salesman, you need to try to break it up. So thinking like a dealer created this incredible violence to the source base. Because now, if I want to write about the Jews of Bordeaux, where do I go? I go to Bordeaux. Maybe I think I need to go to Paris. But I go to Cincinnati, and I go to Israel, and I go to Boston, and I go to New York, all to see stuff that was produced by the same agency. This work of dispersal is, you can think of it as a violence even more so with some of this stuff, like these, this document, I can't even tell what it is. Um, if you read in the catalog of Hebrew Union College that when they tried to catalog this and they describe it in the inventory, they don't even really know what it is. When you pull a document totally out of context, when it's not near the other stuff that was produced at the same time for the same purpose, and it's not anywhere near the agency that produced it, how are you supposed to understand it, right? It goes beyond language. You make sense of things by it being grouped with other stuff produced at the same time. That's called the principle of provenance. And he completely um, disrupts that and makes it very hard to do the history. At the same time, so that's bad, right? He's a thief of our ability to understand the past. But at the same time, we need to understand that documents like this, I think, um, and certainly documents like this that he found in the back of synagogues would never have been made available to researchers had Tchaikovsky not taken them. This was a thing that he found in the back of a synagogue in Paris. Synagogues didn't make their papers available. I don't know how he got back there, but he did. Now, I could use it. You know, I could go to Cincinnati and see it. I would never have been, so even though I would have thought to look for it in Paris, really, the only reason I ever saw it is because he sold it. So paradoxically, he made this stuff available. Now you might say, what about in France? Aren't there subtractions there? There are, but it was only when the French became aware of these thefts that they sought to protect their patrimony by going and cataloging and making available those synagogue collections. So the reason why you could see similar things in Paris is as a response to Tchaikovsky's thefts. Again, theft created memory. So all of this is, and this is the point of um, my lecture tonight, is that this is an ambiguous legacy. On the one hand, it's a story of theft. Although Tchaikovsky's buyers uh, thought they were rescuing Jewish history from the ashes of Europe, they were buying from a thief and colluding in his theft. And that thief's intentions were certainly selfish and his actions were criminal. But at the same time, what he did was ultimately productive because it laid not only the intellectual, but also the material foundations for French Jewish history. So in the end, what I found it is that it's not just Tchaikovsky's work as a scholar that made him a founding father of French Jewish history. It's also his work as an archive thief. Thank you. Thank you.
Now maybe... <laughs> Thank you. Cool. I have to say, I was with Judaic Library here for 15 years. And I know that uh, there are a lot of this materials, both in the Magnus and in these work of collection, that are the result of efforts to save Jewish books. Yeah. Because that many of them are uh, of a condition that if you were rare books of fire, in many cases, you never would have bought because they were falling apart, they were damaged in some ways. But here in this case, Seymour Frommer, who was the founder of Magnus, yep. and other people over time, acquired these books. And when you go and actually catalog them, you find that there are only maybe one or two copies somewhere else in the world. Yeah. It might not be the best copy, but it certainly is a copy that can be used for scholars. Otherwise, they never would have uh, survived it would have been tossed out in some way. Right, and one thing that was pointed out to me by another Judea, and I so appreciate your comment, one, another thing that was pointed out to me by the New York Public Library, Judaica librarian, he said, look, when you work in this field, one of the things you become aware of is pretty much any book that was in Europe before the Nazis, if it's still around today and available for sale, it has some kind of checkered history. Absolutely. That's just some, a fact of the field. So it's not that, you know, even though I, it always, I think, is shocking to my audiences when they see, like, these mutilated um, documents, it's not surprising to Jacob librarians because of, they're so knowledgeable of what this stuff has gone through, and you can't easily retrace it, you know. On the other hand, then think about Tchaikovsky, who's just, like, a guy, you know. Um, so, you know, there is an element of collusion there in this specific case as well. And so one of the questions to me was always, how do they get from, you know, there's a general um, belief that you don't ask these questions because they're just not relevant in this case, it's more important to save. Um, and then there's a more specific question. When you know this guy is stealing, remember how he died? Or why he died? He was caught stealing where? Yeah. New York Public Library. New York Public Library is one of the collections bought from him. When you know that there's someone who, for decades and decades, is stealing and also selling to you, isn't that a kind of different, right? Shouldn't you put that in a different register? Um, so that's something that puzzled me a lot. But I think I am, you know, that they lumped it in with this larger mission of rescue, which is very important. You know, it's, it's the basis for Jewish knowledge for the future. You mentioned that 75% um, of French Jewry survived the Holocaust, whereas most of the rest of European Jewry did not. No. Why did the French Jews survive? Yeah, great question, and one that Tchaikovsky wrote about in several really important um, works. Probably his most famous work um, is A Gazetteer. And in this work, what he argues is that French Jews saved themselves by making contacts with people in the countryside. So they emptied out of Paris. You know, French Jews had been really concentrated in the city of Paris. They, many of them, went into the countryside and approached people to be asking to be rescued, right? To be hidden in the countryside or, or just um, hiding themselves. And, you know, this is why you have so many stories of children um, who were rescued in that way by being living under assumed identities with other families. And that's basically the most important reason is that, you know, what Tchaikovsky found in this gazetteer is that you can find mentions of Jews living in thousands of tiny towns during the war years. That's what they did. Um, and if they'd all stayed in Paris, they would have been rounded up, right? And the ones who stayed in Paris were much more likely to be rounded up. Um, and this went, this, self-saving through fanning out into the countryside where they had never lived before um, was true of recent immigrants to the same extent as it was of native French Jews. This is a really um, interesting um, phenomenon. Um, when you use the word thin, uh, is it a little bit more complicated as you alluded to because even in the Talmud there's a lot of discussion as to what your obligation is if you, for instance, find money in the road. Yeah. 
all of these things probably in his eyes had no moment. Yeah. Uh, and so to say theft um, may be a little too prejudicial. Huh? And it's possible, would you would you think that the psychology, well, I'm saving it, I'm saving it, I'm saving it, now I'm still doing it, but I'm making a little money, now this is what I do, I take things out of the library. Exactly. And that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what I got to. You know, here is the organizing principle of his life that during the war made him a hero. In the aftermath of the war, he keeps doing the same activity, though its meaning shifts, obviously, in reality, but in his mind, it organizes him. Right? This is how pathology works. He keeps doing it even though it's no longer appropriate. Um, I would say, though, of course, the reality is that is theft, even if, in his mind, it's something else, right? May I also ask, did he leave any written memoir of what he did over his life or a suicide note that was invited? No. Because the crime of taking something from the public library, what could the punishment be? I mean, oh my gosh, that's huge. So think, you're a historian, but you don't have a university position. So it meant that they were definitely, whether or not he was going to go to jail, he was never going to go back to the New York Public Library, right? And that is totally, how is he going to be who he is? His whole life is about that. The other thing is, it meant that they were going to call Yivo, where he worked for like practically no money, and Yivo, who had turned, they turned a blind eye for, you know, decades. How are they going to keep turning a blind eye? So they were going to fire him. So what does he have left? Right? I think that that's where the, the kind of reckoning um, was really sad. Yeah. I just wondered if he had developed a sense of ownership over the paper that he had developed. I know. I wondered what happened to his own family. Yeah. He was very much alone. Yeah, so, I mean, he had a wife, and they had a son. By all accounts, by the end of his life, he was li they were still living in the same one-bedroom apartment together, um, but he was pretty estranged from his, it was not a good marriage, um, so he was probably pretty alone, felt very alone, even though he was married. And his, um, you know, a lot of people believed, like the Alliance Library from Paris believed that probably in the, there's a lot of rumors I heard that in the basement storage unit, there was just like a huge pile of papers. And they even wrote to Yivo after they heard Tchaikovsky died and, and demanded, you know, go into the basement and look in the storage unit and see if there's any of our stuff. And people even asked me this, like when I was like, I'm researching this, like, I know in the basement of the have you ever gone to 108th Street and the corner of Amsterdam, there's a building, go in the basement. Um, but the reality was he had sold everything. Um, and all there was, his, his, his widow died in 2012 when I was researching this book. And um, all there was left was family photos. Um, and those went to Evo at that point. But what happened to his family? What happened to them? I mean, in the United States. Oh, you mean his family before they all died? Yeah. He had one sister in law and three nieces who survived in Paris. And they wound up moving to Mexico. Yeah, and that's it. Everybody else, everybody, all his brothers were in the resistance and were killed, and all of his family in Poland died. Yeah. Are, are there any stolen do documents on the West Coast? <laughs> Not that I know of, though, again, it's very hard to tell, right? So it's entirely possible, but he never, that I know of, made his way to the West Coast. So most of the places where he sold, he sold in person. He brought them, um, interacted in person. So I don't know of any uh, California collection that has stuff. Lisa, the, the fact is, that to my, the best of my knowledge, personally, never bought anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was at that stage in the 50s, in the 60s, um, most of the, they, they weren't really that interested in building Mm. Um, although they had some, as they built, of uh, an excellent, where books 
collection. The fact, and the other thing is that Stanford acquired the some of her own collection. Right. And I, I'm not aware, I've never asked this question, whether any Salvador himself or part of what his collection was may have contained any of these things. Yeah. But, uh, so that, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing here. I yeah, don't I don't think there is there. either, but I've been surprised before. Yeah, uh, thank you for the very uh, fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the trajectory of the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction uh, Incorporation, uh, kind of the context about which it was founded and what, what ended up happening with that and with the yeah. works that it acquired. Yeah, so um, first of all, I should tell you, there is like one of the best dissertations ever on this topic by Dana Herman, if you get interested in this topic, that is the go-to dissertation. But um, this group, it's the same group that winds up during the war, um, you know, already during the war they're mobilized. It's this group of New York intellectuals, mostly refugees. And um, it's the same group that winds up founding Jewish Social Studies, the journal. It's all coming out of the same thing. It's a concern with the, you know, what's going to be the future of Jewish learning and Jewish libraries and Jewish culture. And all in the same mentality of like Jewish self-defense. This is how we defend ourselves against anti-Semitism. So they wind up, you know, in 1947, the US government gives them the right to take possession of all this airless material and distribute it. That process takes five years. By the end, of, they're distributing it primarily in the US, then after Israel's founded, also in a lot of stuff in Israel, and then also to some degree in um, like, South Africa and um, Australia and Latin America. And the British fight really hard to be part of it. So there's a group founded by Cecil Roth, the English Historical Society, and he's like, I want it on, the, you know, like, we're the surviving Jewry. And they're pretty much um, kept mostly out and don't get a ton of stuff. The Alliance, like the French, want to be given um, stuff, and they do get some, but very little. And the Germans fight directly with, there are German Jewish surviving communities that fight with um, Hannah Arendt, um, this community of Hamburg in particular, to keep their stuff. There's stories like, you know, a municipal librarian, like a Gentile, who had protected Jewish records during the war, and they're like, these things are, you know, have been here for 500 years, they should stay. And Hannah Arendt is like, you know, he's a very well-meaning guy, but he's not facing the reality that there's no hope for rebuilding in Germany, so we're taking, you know, we're gonna take whatever we can. We, we can't force it, but basically, we need to take stuff out. So that's how the distributions went. Um, and you can, there's a lot of materials um, that come from there. Can I ask a question? Um, so, in 47, they were on to him, and they, yes. did, they did nothing. And then he, he was caught again in Strasbourg, I think, in 61. That's right. Yeah. And again, same story. No, well, that's the one time they did something. Right. Okay, but right. they weren't able to actually put him in jail. Right, right. So I just wonder, what has, has there been, what was the reaction to your book in, yes. in, in France? And I mean, the community, I'm not talking about the viewers like you know, Pierre Denmark, but Yeah, he liked it. Yeah, yeah. But, but in general, right. Right. So, like, when I was writing, you know, like, I took forever to write this book, and I like sat in the archives in France forever, like, talking to the archivists about it, and they're, you know, they they basically were like, oh, I'm so glad you're working on this story. Like, you need to make a list. Like, your book should be just like a list of all the documents with where they came from, and where they are now, and then. That would be so useful, and then you could give it to the like foreign ministry, and they'll get it back. Thank you. And um, and that was completely impossible, and not at all. You know, you, you heard my talk. Um, like I'm interested in the ambiguity of the meaning of it, um, and I'm actually not that good at making a list. I would like I looked at the you know it just have, would have been completely like beyond what I could do. And I think that dis honestly disappointed them very much, that this, to them, results in nothing. You know, like, what have I done? I've told a story, I don't make them look particularly good, and they're none the closer to getting stuff back. 
But then the other part of that is, I'm not sure, like there's a lot of talk about wanting it or how wrong this is and that they should get their stuff back. But I think among Judaica librarians today, this is not the direction that anyone is going and it doesn't really make sense. We have the technology to repair scattered collections in a very different way now. We don't have to fight over who owns the physical thing. I think this might be part of why they don't actually take any measures. It's more about could we digitize in ways that everybody can use it, right? It doesn't need to be at the, all of these institutions today are in financial crisis. Um, so the, the thing that would make the most sense if they had resources would not be repatriation. Yeah. Well, I think we should leave it there and thank Lisa for <laughs>